So uh, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about what Summer Session Study Abroad and Lifelong Learning is first. Summer Sessions is, is really the monster. It's uh, 16,000 students, uh, 600 different courses, and uh, five different sessions during 12 weeks during the summer at UC Berkeley. Of those 16,000 students, about 12,000 of them are actual are regular Berkeley students making progress towards their degree. About 4,000 of them are visiting students. We just mean that just means not matriculated at any UC campus. And 3,000 of those 4,000 visiting students are international visiting students that primarily come through university partnerships. So we have partnerships with about 90 different universities around the world, um, and some what we refer to as registration centers, which might aggregate a lot of smaller universities so we don't have to have lots of little relationships. We might have one larger relationship. Um, and that's that's $42 million a year of revenue. You know, that's that's the monster. That pays for everything, and it's uh, it's what we spend a lot of our time on uh, over at, at summer sessions here at, at Berkeley. Study abroad is part of that, and the numbers are much less impressive, but they're still important. It's about 1,500 Berkeley students going abroad every year through exchange programs with partners, through um, faculty-led programs through Berkeley. And, um, and it's all sorts of uh, you know, special programs through the Danish Institute of Study Abroad or CIE or something like that. So that's, that's all student mobility. It's also several hundred students, probably four or 500 students coming to Berkeley from those reciprocal exchange agreements. So students you know, having a study abroad experience here at, at UC Berkeley. And then lifelong learning, refers to our program for retirees. So that's, you know, you basically finished your career, you want to continue to engage in continuous learning, you're not really interested in tests and papers and finals and degrees and all that comes along with it. So we designed a program so that people who really just want to continue learning can take classes, can engage with our faculty, can be part of the community, but not really have, receive any assessment during that. It's a little bit unique, it's about 1,500 members that we have. Um, 50 to you know about 95 is our age range, age range I say so got about three generations in there of people and uh, it's all specially designed around uh, cognitive health neural plasticity you know all the research shows you have to have lots of extra and new brain you know neural pathways in order to stave off dementia and you're not going to get that by just playing Sudoku a lot right so you need to really engage in, in learning that's outside your comfort zone where you're actually creating new neural pathways. So if you love Sudoku, we'll tell you, you should take a painting class. Or if you've been a dancer, you should take a, a, a history course or something like that. You know, it really has to be something that you haven't done a lot. Changing up you know, what type of card game you play isn't gonna grow new neural pathways. So uh, there's all sorts of research around. That's what keeps us healthy as we age. Even research coming out more, most recently that um, people uh, with higher degrees recover from brain injuries quicker than those without higher degrees because they have more brain matter to work around those brain injuries and stuff. So, so keep your brains active, keep them healthy. So, so that summer session study abroad and lifelong learning. Um, this presentation is about partnerships, university partnerships. I'm a university, I have lots of partners with universities, but also with non-universities. And I know that this group is made up a lot of folks that are part of those, what we would call third parties that want to partner with, with places like UC Berkeley. So I'll do my best to, 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 to steer it in that direction. Also, I, I'm, I'm not really interested in talking at you for an hour. So please see this as just a format for you to interject your question or your comment or interact in any which way you like. You will not be offending or, or uh, interrupting me because that makes it a lot more interesting for you and for me. So at any point, please engage. So I started out with just what are the types of partnerships that UC Berkeley has, right? Affiliate universities, that's basically, you know, the London School of Economics, National University of Singapore, Todai University. I mean, it's, it's, it's major preeminent universities around the world. We partner with them. We do all sorts of things with them, and that's, that's what I'm going to talk through a little bit next. Berkeley Abroad Partners, these are um, universities where we're running programs at their university. So... Uh, at the University of Barcelona, my, I have a faculty member who takes 50 students every summer to Barcelona. They do a program on migration from Northern Africa to, to Barcelona. And you know, it's, it's a fascinating, interesting program. They're earning Berkeley credit while, at, while in Barcelona and studying 
at and with University of Barcelona faculty. So that is what a Berkeley Abroad Partnership would be like. And then independent program providers. So that's the Danish Institute for Study Abroad, that's CIE, that's IES Abroad, that's all of these large nonprofit you know, organizations that, that run uh, programs that we partner with as well so our students can have, can have study abroad experiences. And, and if, if you think of like a theme around what we do, we, we do things kind of for two different reasons. You know, one, we do them because we need to earn revenue, and that's that 16,000 student, 4,000 international visitors, $42 million operation. And we do things because it's the right thing for our students and faculty, right? We need our students to be global citizens, to go out there and have a worldwide perspective and understand different cultures and be able to operate in the workforce. And that's why we're taking a lot of that money and spending it on relationships, partnerships, reciprocal exchange, third party providers to help our students have those experiences. And our faculty be there as well because it's important for them to spend the summer in Barcelona and be able to conduct their research and make linkages with other faculty members at other important universities. So, so that's what's going on and why we're doing all this sort of stuff. So what I thought I would do is maybe demonstrate, you know what, you see me in the jacket, I'm hot, I'm taking it off. <laughs> <laughs> So, I thought I'd walk through an example of how basically relationships grow at UC Berkeley and how we partner with institutions in general, all different types, right? So, I thought I'd go with the National University of Singapore. Amazing institution doing cutting edge, cutting edge research, spectacular students that perform really, really well here. And this, talk, this talks about the UC Education Abroad Program. So that's traditional, reciprocal exchange, right? They send us 50 students, we send back 50 students, nobody pays tuition anywhere, our students have a direct immersive experience at each other's universities. That's how it started, that's very traditional, that's the way study abroad's been since it started, you know, 50 years ago at UC, and that's how our relationship with National University of, of Singapore started. Rick? Yes? Question. I, I get the concept of, of exchange and you know, no money changing hands, does Berkeley go after institutions that you know, have a higher cost of living associated in that country? Is there any like game You there? know, the, 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 I would say that's never really um, part of the thought process. You know, I mean, UK is number one study abroad location. It really doesn't get much more expensive than that, right? So I'd say we're looking for institutions that we would consider to be of the same caliber as far as educational experience goes for two reasons. We're sending our students there for a semester. If they're taking their differential equations course at the National University of Singapore instead of here, when they get back and they move into the next level of that you know, course you know, evolution, they need to have gotten the education they need in order to succeed here at Berkeley, right? So, so when, we're, when we're evaluating, are we partnering with a particular university, we wanna know, are our students gonna get what they need when they're there? On the flip side, the students coming here, they can't be flunking out they can't be drawing down the quality of our classrooms here. I mean, if anyone here has ever taught in a classroom, you only need one or two students who are not in the same place as the rest of the students that could really drag down the quality and experience for everybody in the room, right? So we wanna make sure on the receiving end, these students are gonna succeed here at Cal. And the worst thing that could happen to a student is come here, get a transcript from Berkeley with a bunch of bad grades on it. Like you just shot your chances at grad school, you know, for life, right? You know, so, so that's not a good, good outcome. So, so that's where we start. And then, you know, you're, you're then, you know, you, you, you would start with, with the caliber of that institution and is it in a location that's attractive to students that they want to go there? Can we create balance? You know, if 50 students want to come here and one wants to go back, that's not a very successful, sustainable financial model, right? You know, I can't put 50 students here in one seat, right? So there has to be enough demand on both sides for that balance to happen. And that's probably one of the biggest things we struggle with because, you know, I'll be frank with you, Berkeley is popular, right? If I sent every single student that we had abroad all at once, I would still have more demand for students to come in than I could possibly ever meet, right? So, so that's a lot of what we're, we're doing is trying to find partners where we know our students wanna go. And so you, you, we have a dozen in England, you know? I mean, like, we, we got plenty of students that wanna go there, right? And when, um, you know, a, a school from Ecuador wants to partner, we'll, we'll say, how about one? You know, like that's probably about as many as I could get to go there every year, you know, if I throw them a big scholarship. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yeah. 
Okay. So we started out with uh, exchange, the traditional you know uh, avenue. Then we we went to meet with them, and what happened with NUS, and this is what was is great for us. And when I when I talk about that challenge, you know, NUS came to us and said, you know, we want more spaces at Berkeley. We want to be able to send more of our students, and because of this balance issue, you don't have enough spaces. And we said, oh well, there's Berkeley summer sessions. It's the same courses. We got sixteen thousand students. We've got plenty of space. It's six thousand bucks a pop, but you know, Singapore, you guys have cash, right? And uh, they went from and they jumped on it. They said, yes, absolutely, we want to do it. First year, fifty students. The next year, hundred students. The next year, hundred and fifty students. I mean, that you know, they, the word of mouth has just gotten out at NUS, and it's fantastic. And their students are great. They come here, they get great grades. Their English is perfect. Like it's it's a really excellent partnership. And that's how we've sort of evolved over time um, in increasing relationships with them. So here we'll talk about um, benefits. It says, so priority registration, fee ba rebates and stuff. This is, these are also ways in which we make it attractive for partners to send uh, students to us. So it's a little bit like a frequent flyer program. You send 10 students, we give you $300, back, $300 back per student. Send 20 students, we got buses going to the airport to pick them up. Send 25 students, complimentary room and board for a chaperone, which is usually whoever works in the office there that wants to come to Berkeley, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then what we consider sort of more like the, the real top line you know, benefit. At 35 students, it's a visiting, it's an invitation to a visiting scholar from their university to come to Berkeley, to spend the summer, get a faculty ID, have a J-1 visa, um, and we'll do introductions to faculty in their, their specified area. And, uh, and they, they have access to our 34 libraries, our billion volumes of research materials, or any, any, any other research facility. So it's where we dial it up when we say, oh, if you've got at least 35 students coming to us, our relationship is more than just thanks for the money, right? It says we should start doing additional things. We should have faculty engaging with each other. Faculty, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily have big resources to be able to get on a plane and fly to Berkeley and, and, and get access that they need to our faculty and, and administration and visas and da da da. And we say, hey, you know, we're gonna facilitate that for you. We're gonna begin those linkages. And that's exactly what does happen is you invite an economics faculty, you start introducing them to the economics faculty here, you give them the resources that they need, and the next thing you know, ideas are sparking and there's cross-border research projects happening and there's the next big thing that we're doing with that university, right? We can't facilitate everything in the study abroad office. So just planting those seeds and, 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 and making connections and providing the resources to do that makes those things occur. But then it strengths and strength, oh, sorry, strengthens, makes, makes better <laughs> uh, our relationship with them. And when I'm there visiting their vice president who says, we send you 150 students here, and when you multiply that by six thousand dollars, that's that's a million dollars. Like we're sending you a check for a million dollars every year. And I say, did you hear about Professor So and So who was at Berkeley? And and it makes it all worth it. It makes it interesting for them, or they're lining up to be the next visiting scholar to come to UC Berkeley. So, so as much as you know, the first you know example of our relationship was very reciprocal and very easy because of the the demand situation we're in. We're able to create a relationship where a million dollars of revenues flowing towards our university, but also we're doing as much as we can to make them feel and perceive that we're giving back as much as we can, and it's worth their while, it's worth their million dollars, right? And their students are having great experiences. It's fantastic for us also as a recruiting tool. These are smart students who come here, perform really well, get a Berkeley transcript with a couple of A's, and then decide, you know what, I think I might like to go to UC Berkeley for graduate school. And we've already essentially vetted them here on our campus for six or eight weeks, and they already decided they really like it and want to be here. It's not the usual situation, which is, I've never set foot on your campus, but I want to move across the world and, and, and be successful there. And so, so it's really, it's 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 win-win for us as when, when you're looking at how we can recruit, you know, potential, potential students. Any questions so far? Okay. So, this was the next evolution of what happened with the National University of Singapore. We decided, oh great, you're sending us 150 students a year. It would be great if we had more going on at NUS. We want our students to be having experiences in Singapore. And what our students really want are internships. 
So how can we collaborate with the National University of Singapore to create academic, cultural, and work experiences for our Berkeley students? This was uh, an expansion of what we call our global internship program. Singapore was maybe the third or fourth location. And you've got three circles here because it's, it's demonstrating the model that we have at Berkeley on how it's Berkeley study abroad. So we're, we're taking our students, sending them, sending them over there. We have the National University of Singapore. They live there in their housing. They take a course from an NUS faculty member and all about Singaporean society and how they integrate into sort of that region of the world and are an economic hub and, and what, you know, so, they can, so the students can learn about the place they're in. And it's taught by an NUS faculty, but we appoint them as a Berkeley faculty so the students actually get that grade and credit on their Berkeley transcript. And because it's Berkeley transcript, they're also eligible for financial aid to help pay for that. So it really helps facilitate you know, that process for, for underserved students. I'm not sure if you all know this, but 40% of Berkeley students pay no tuition. 80% receive institutional aid. We educate more Pell eligible, which means the neediest students, more Pell eligible students at Berkeley than all the Ivy Leagues combined. UCLA also does that. UC San Diego also does that. So, you know, our model is one of size. We have 24,000 undergraduates here. You know, Stanford has 4,000. And 40% of ours don't pay any tuition. So the numbers are really astonishing, right? So when I'm saying I'm, I'm sending 1,500 students abroad and I want to double that number, I want more Berkeley students to have that abroad experience, I got to help them pay for it because that's the only way it's going to happen. So when I sit with the National University of Singapore and say, I want to send my students here, and yeah, I want your professor to teach that course, but I need it to be a Berkeley course. I need it to be Berkeley credit. I get sometimes funny looks like, well, why wouldn't you want the NUS transcript? Why wouldn't you want you know, it to come from us? And I explain that 40% pay no, tui no tuition. We're trying to create opportunities here. And they get it, and they work with us, and then, and then all of a sudden it's okay that their professor is being appointed by, by Berkeley as well, which, which isn't a problem because they're great professors, right? And why would we would appoint them anyway? So it works out great. So they're living there. They're taking that local course. Then academic, academic Internship Council is probably what an organization similar to what many of you are in here. They're a nonprofit organization that places interns around the world. We also grew, well, at AIC, I should say, grew with Berkeley. You know, we started working with them in the Bay Area. We said, help us you know, place our interns here. Then we said, we want to open in Singapore. Will you go with us? They flew over to Singapore, started hiring people, and started an operation there. And that's because I can't, I can't afford, I work for the state of California. I can't hire three people in Singapore to run around and place interns and interview them and make sure they're having a good experience and do all this work. It's not possible, right? But I can pay a contract to a third party that can hire those people and provide those services. And then they can also leverage it and provide it to lots of universities, right? So they're now working with a, a number of institutions placing internship, interns in Singapore. So Academic Internship Council places our students in Singapore, manage that, manages that process from beginning to end. They're doing Skype interviews. They're finding out what their interests are, placing them, greeting them upon arrival, making sure they're having a good experience, dealing with problems. All I'm doing is photocopying all day. They're intervening and saying, hey, you guys promised to give these people meaningful work. They're not going to get good grades if all their papers are about photocopying all day, right? And US is teaching the course on the local context. And then where Berkeley is study abroad comes back in, we currently are in the Bay Area, Singapore, Toronto, Mumbai, Paris, Madrid, London and Dublin with our global internship program. Mexico City is the next location to launch next year. We enroll all of the students from all locations in one online course being delivered from Berkeley simultaneously. And they have, through that course, a reflective experience about their work. This is completely contrived because what we hear from employers is, oh, it's great that they went abroad and it's great that they did an internship, but if they can't connect that to how they're going to bring that to the workplace when they're interviewing with us. We just think they went and had a great time and, and it might as well have just been a big you know, paid holiday, right? But if they can articulate to us in that interview, while I was at Sing Health in Singapore, you know, I learned these skills or it opened my mind this way or it's going to bring you know, this context of uh, experience to this job. They say you know, we really value it then. We think it sets them aside from someone else, right? 
well, what do you think we make them do in the eighth week of that course? <laughs> Imagine you're in an interview. <laughs> Write a paper about what you, how you would articulate you know, connecting the experiences you've had, right? So we're going to actually make them do that near the end of the course because we know it's going into their mental toolkit. And when they're asked that question six months or a year later in a job interview, well, that, that paper is just going to pop right back in their mind and they're going to be able to articulate it. So we're, we're creating this reflective environment from the beginning. You know, I know one of my favorite assignments that they give them is uh, it's around gender roles in the workplace, right? So, so what are you observing about different genders in, in this workplace and in this country that you're in, right? So the students start a, a conversation through a cyber environment from all of these different locations. So what are gender roles like in Mumbai versus Toronto versus the Bay Area versus Singapore? And then I'm in a commercial bank, I'm in an NGO, I'm in a theater, you know, how, how is it different that way too? So you've got this intercultural theme, but also this interdisciplinary theme because they're all doing wildly different things in very, very different places, but the same question. They're all being asked, right? So hearing the postings, you may think, oh yeah, this is what I'm observing. What's not happening? And what are you hearing about what's happening in other cultures, right? So I always say, you know, you don't really learn what you are until you learn what you're not, right? And so that's one of the best ways to, to help students understand what it is they're actually experiencing. And so we have to do it in that cyber environment. So this, again, is this you know, evolution of partnership where you know, we started just exchanging students. Now they're sending us 150 students in the summer. Now we've got their faculty coming over and engaging in research projects. Now I've got 50 students. It's only 50 because they, they, we can't fit 50 more, more than 50 in the classroom. There'd be 100 if, if we could, or if the students, you know, if we admitted every student that wanted to go. <laughs> And that's why each location is opening one after another. It's premier universities like that. It's the University of Toronto. It's Tech de Monterey in Mexico. It's University College Dublin. I mean, these are we're we're selecting great partners to do this work with, right? So, so then we evolve again. <laughs> and in this case, we started um, realizing that well, it's great that we have a piece of paper that says our students can go there and your students come back and we won't charge tuition and all of that. What we haven't figured out is I'm a third year, you know, uh, mechanical engineer and I'm going to go over to the National University of Singapore for a semester and no one has figured out if the differential equations course over at NUS is going to articulate back here at Berkeley. And the process that we had was, oh, when you get back, show us the transcript and we'll let you know. Sure, let me drop 15 grand on this program and, you know, hope afterwards that it'll transfer, right? There's not a lot, especially with our demographic of students, not a lot of them who can take that kind of a risk, right? So now we've engaged with them, with our engineering faculties to say, let's figure it out. We've each got 200 engineering courses. We need to figure out about a dozen that we know we're going to agree, slide back and forth, interchangeable, you know, electricity is electricity no matter where you're teaching it, you know. So we know that, in fact, I mean, when I started these conversations, I got comments like, well, they couldn't possibly teach them as well as we do. And I'd say, well, aren't some of the, didn't some of them get their PhDs from here? Oh, well, that would be okay, you know, and well, isn't differential equations, differential well, that course would be okay. And I'd be like, great, <laughs> let's start there, right? So it was just also helping get the faculty's mind around some things are just truisms and we're just getting it done and they can get it done anywhere. And hey, by the way, you don't have to teach it here if they took it over there. I mean, we're so overcrowded, it's actually creating a bit of a pressure valve pressure release valve at Berkeley to have students getting some of those courses out of the way in other parts of the world. So this articulation credit transferability is just making our existing agreements more successful because we're, we're basically paving the way for students to have an easier and better experience. Yeah? What if um, you have a, you know, a percentage of Berkeley students that don't want to go to your destinations? Well, so that's what we are, this is probably the newest, latest, and greatest thing that we're, we're doing at Berkeley. We're called, we refer to it as pre-approved third-party programs, right? So, and this is absolutely true, Berkeley cannot be everything to everybody. We cannot have a relationship on every program. I use um, Russian language majors as a great example. We do not have enough Russian language majors to open a program in Moscow or St. Petersburg or to even have a reciprocal exchange agreement with, it's just not enough, right? But Middlebury College or C IES Abroad or CIE, they have programs that are great. Like we, no one would you know, shake a stick at them. We think they're really good. So what we've done, and, and this was a little bit of 
you know, I, I always refer to things as BR and AR, before Rick and after Rick. So before Rick, you had to withdraw from the university, go on the program, get your grades, reapply for admission, bring in your transcript, and hope they transfer it, right? That was our process, so you can imagine how successful and how many people engaged in it, right? So we created what we call the Study Abroad Advisory Board, which is a, a group of faculty. So it's not like a system of governance over Berkeley Study Abroad. And when we identify a program like that, and sometimes it's just by looking at data and saying, God, a whole bunch of students go on this Danish Institute of Study Abroad. That was the first one that we did because these architecture students loved it and the college liked it. And we were like, why are we reviewing this thing 10 times a year? Like, let's just review it once really, really well. And then we'll tell them it, it transfers and here are the course articulations and whatever. So we went through that process. We get a faculty member who is passionate about that particular program and that's, that's a key element. If, if there's no faculty member that's interested, it doesn't matter how much everybody wants to do it, it's not gonna happen, right? So it starts, starts there where we can find an interested, dedicated faculty member. We get all the syllabi back, it's all run through, it's articulated into the curriculum, and then we enter into an agreement with that third party saying, okay, you're pre-approved. It, it goes on a list here at Berkeley, so the students can say, absolutely, I wanna, I wanna go on that program, I know what it's gonna transfer. We put them on a leave of absence. No withdrawal, no readmission. They can still make, they can still enroll in classes for the next semester. I mean, you withdraw, you don't get an appointment to, to sign up for classes. You know, like it's just simple things like that that become really, really difficult. Your email account expires after a time, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, so we put them on that status, and then they come back, they've got their transcript, it all transfers right in. It's very, it's very, very easy. But also for summer? You do peer proof for summer? You know, yes and no. Um, this is a new thing. We've only had it for a couple of years. Um, there's what, what's different about summer is there's no uh, no leave of absence because it's summer, right? So you don't need to go on the program. We could easily pre-approve a program if the faculty would articulate the courses. Then we could put it on the pre-approved list and they could transfer the courses in really easily. But they wouldn't go on leave of absence because they wouldn't need to, right? right? And that's when I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking on the side why I really want to hear about students going on your summer programs. I, I want to hear from all of you because I can tell when they take a leave of absence where they went. And if 10 of them went to the Danish Institute of Study Abroad, I'll say, oh, there's a candidate for pre-approval, right? But if a dozen of them go on a summer program, there's no mechanism that notifies me that they went there unless they transfer back to classes, and often they don't because we have unit caps at Berkeley and you don't want too many units, and if it's not <coughs> directly applying to your major, well, then why transfer the course? You know, so, so a lot of it, I think, slips through the cracks. But, you know, just a report from, from your institutions or companies telling us what they did, that, that gives us a clue as to what's, what's going on. Did you have a follow-up question? I did. Go ahead. Because I'm curious about the way you're, about internships. So sure. what you're talking about is a faculty kind of is passionate about this and then there's some coursework that can um, translate. But what we hear from a lot of students, particularly at Berkeley, is that they want to do an internship, let's say in Uruguay, but they can't because it's almost impossible to get any kind of credit transfer. So well, you mean for internship? For, for contact hours, right. Yeah. Is there, is there, if it's not an academic program, is it pretty hard for them to get even just study abroad credit or even just, I don't know, Spanish credit? You know, we hear this I lot. mean, I feel like you answered your own question. If it's not an academic program, they can't can get they credit? get credit? They're, you don't know. <laughs> it's, well, you know it's, it's not that funny. I mean, a lot of universities are actually giving substantial credit for internships abroad. Mm -hmm. Berkeley, it seems like is it a stronger, it's a difficult, more difficult path to... You know, we do give credit for internships, but it's for academic work done around internships. So that internship course that I talked about, right, we make, we're requiring them to have a reflective experience to well. articulate back to us what's going on, not just doing the work, right? And that's that's something that our faculty have been clear about, like credit for work is, is not gonna happen, right? So that's quality control though. Like your area, quality control in terms of aligning the internships with prioritize partners in order to make sure but so, so that's exactly what, what's happening, right? So you know, we partner with Academic Internship Council, with USA. But we, specifically for those priority partners that you guys have aligned, is that correct? You said in Toronto, Mexico is coming on board, London, Singapore. So you've aligned those priority partners that can actually assist an Academic Internship Council actually facilitates the students through those providers? Right, so in all those locations. So it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a three-party agreement, right? So yes. one party is the university. That's accommodations and local context and local course and 
student union and all that, a partner like the Academic Internship Council or USO or someone else that's doing the placement so that we, we're comfortable that they're not making ice cream cones for their uncle or whatever, right, you know, mm -hmm. that they're having a, a, a substantial, real, qualified, you know, work experience. And then we're granting the credit through our online course that's having them have an academic experience around that internship, right? At this point, that would provide limitations in the numbers of students that can become involved. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Yes. yeah. It's, it's, you so have to go through those channels, right? A student that wants to have a, an academic internship would have to, in order to actually receive credit here at your institution, go through that particular channel. Yeah, I mean, the other option they have is to receive credit from another institution. You know, if, if Berkeley's going to grant credit, we're going to require that we assess the learning. Right, just like anything, we don't grant credit for you know a statistics course that you take in another university. We grant credit for for credits you've earned here. Right, same thing with internship. If there was another institution that was granting that credit, then we would look at it for transfer credit. Right. The only the only exception, and it's it's just been piloted this summer, is I had you know student representatives coming to me and saying. You know, we really want to do uh, a, a, uh, an internship. We want credit for it. We need credit because some of the employers require it because they're not paying them, and there's you know labor laws and all that sort of stuff. But um, we're not finding it through your program, or we can't afford your program, or whatever the reasons are, right? So we've, for this first summer, made an alliance with uh, the Career Center because that vetting is really important. I said, I said, I'm not going to give credits for ice cream cones, right? So. Um, the Career Center plays the role of saying, all right, well, where's your internship? What are you going to be doing? Who's your supervisor? What's the length, right? They will make those calls, have them fill out a form saying, you know, this is legitimate, this is real. Or, you know, if it's it's at Goldman Sachs or Google, okay. <laughs> you know, some of it's very cursory, right? But it's just, it's that quality control. And then again, the student then earns the credit. It's really just the opportunity to be able to earn the credit. And they pay tuition for it. You know, there's, it's also the state of California, there's no free credit, right? So even though 40% don't pay it, we charge it, right? And it's, it's paid for through other means. So um, what we haven't done, and this, uh, we haven't been presented with a solution to this yet, because we're just trying this. The Career Center's agreed to do that for the United States. You know, we haven't figured out if a student wants to do an independent program in Costa Rica, right? Plus, to be frank, our general counsel is really not thrilled for us to be saying, sure, go to Costa Rica on whatever program you want, and we'll just slap credit on it, and you know, like that's that's just a lawsuit waiting to happen because we've essentially endorsed a program by putting credit on it when we may not even know what they're doing, right? So, so we haven't gone there yet. I know for us it's coming, and I'm reluctant to take something like that on when we have a career center that actually can facilitate those sort of things on the ground domestically. But internationally, it's a whole other ballgame, and I'm wondering. I like the, the fact that. Have a model right now, see what the demand is later, and prioritize your partners that can actually handle using the third time It's very slow. Yeah, and it's the, the fastest, it's the fastest growing thing we have. Yeah. You know? Um, well, many universities are going to require it as part of their you know, department. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's happening. Like in EU in Boston, they figured out a way to do it. Um, they have a certain amount of hours, and then the student has to through whatever program they choose that, because they have their own like you guys do, but if, let's say the student wants what you said, Costa Rica or whatever. There's certain things they have to do with their host instance with Berkeley or NEU during the program, after the program, of course, pre to kind of help vet it. So, so it's an hourly thing too. Like it has to be a minimum of 280 hours, let's say. So it's good. It sounds like at least you're open to it. If, a, if enough students start coming to you and saying, you know, I'm a global business management major, I have to do this international internship, Right, you, you well, there are no programs at Berkeley that require that at the moment. Um, I'm, I'll be excited the day that they are, because then you know, it'll help me meet my numbers for getting students abroad. Right, that's certainly a, a, a fast, fat path to uh, to getting more Berkeley students abroad. But you know, it, it comes, it doesn't come down to the dean of study abroad. Right, it comes down to the faculty. Faculty, you know, set the criteria as to what we're going to grant credit for. This is a, 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 a shared governance institution, right? So administrators don't decide how degrees are conferred or credit is, is, is given, which is very different than other universities, actually. I worked at Boston University, and I know Northeastern, and you know, they, things are different. It's very sort of top-down, you know, this is the way it shall be. Um, anyway. Probably worth noting as well, some of the direct exchange partners will offer courses which are academic courses but have an internship component. 
so there may be some students also accessing it that way. Uh, so they'll be getting academic credit for doing a course as part of their semester abroad that'll involve an internship, which they're reflecting on as their academic project. So right, like we, for sure, you know, if, uh, if, 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 like through one of our exchange programs, yeah. they're enrolled in a four credit internship <coughs> program at that institution, that's, yeah. it's transferred. Right? So just to mention, that's probably, I don't know, another thing that's happening there as well. That's, well it's, I think that was that's a little bit of, of what I was trying to get into with uh, with this presentation is you know it, there's a million combinations right I've just talked about one institution and now I'm going to talk about the, the most recent evolution with with National University of Singapore so here you know I talked about you've got NUS Berkeley and Academic Internship Council in Singapore well NUS is also partners with the University of Toronto where we have our partnership with for interns in Toronto. And NUS said, well, we're partners with Berkeley and we're partners with Toronto and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. How about our NUS students just go on the Berkeley Toronto program and earn credit that way and we don't have to, and we thought, fantastic. You know, that's, again, highly qualified, vetted students where we've already worked out so many of the details and now they can just flow to that site. And it's, it's germinated, um, an idea, which is, is really in its infant stage, but NUS and Berkeley are part of the International Alliance of Research Universities. It's 10 you know, global research one universities like Beijing, you know, Peking University, Todai, ETH Zurich, Cambridge, Oxford, Yale, Berkeley's 10, 10 preeminent universities. We said, well, we should be able to start just doing that, like have a matrix of these 10 universities and be moving students all over the place. We've already partnered, we've already agreed that we're all of the same caliber and that we're doing you know similar things let's start leveraging that so student mobility can really start flowing a lot more easily so so that's basically sort of where we are right now in sort of just I, of, of hey you know let's let's leverage what we're doing already to uh, accommodate more students so it's a lot of work I mean when I've talked about academic integration it's a mountain of work because you have to think of every course in every major with every university, you know, you do this all with NUS and then you've got one school done, you know. We have 200 universities that we have these uh, exchange partnerships with. So so if you've already done it between NUS and, and Berkeley, well, and we did it with Toronto, let's just all agree that that was good enough, right? We don't have to do it a third time, right? So, so what else you want to talk about? <laughs> talking about the pre-approved third-party exactly. programs. Yeah. Honestly, it's it's going to be demand of our students, right? So it, it all comes down to are our students going to want to go there, right? That's number one criteria, right? And then when I talked about that study abroad advisory board, they're really looking at it from two major perspectives. One is academic integration. So we're going to need a department or departments who's going to engage in that process and say, yes, you know, Middlebury's Russian program is the bomb and we're gonna take it and that's where we want our students to go, right? So we'll go through that process. It's, you know, like a mountain of paperwork of this course equals this course and this course equals that course and all that due diligence is done, right? And then my office, it's our job to determine is this a safe, reputable place for our students to be? You know, are they recognized by the Ministry of Education in that country? Do they have insurance? Is the housing acceptable, safe, you know, affordable, like we're doing the whole non-academic review of is this the right, the right place for us to be sending our students. So basically together, that academic department or departments at Berkeley uh, Study Abroad comes to the board with sort of a joint recommendation of, you know, we think this is okay, and then it's, it's their jobs to make sure we've done our work, ask the questions that maybe we didn't think of or whatever, and they, they, uh, they give sort of that final approval. So is the process usually student demand leading up to this vetting process or vice versa? Uh, I'd say it's one of two ways. Student demand has, has, has really kind of how it germinated and started because we were turning over rocks, like how can we get more students going abroad? Mm -hmm. When I got appointed, it was, Rick, you need to triple the number of students going abroad. We got to, we're halfway there, like we're going from 1,000 to 1,500, we need to get to 3,000, so we only have to double now, which <laughs> seems like much less, much more attainable goal. Um, 
so it was how do we how do we make this easier and let's find out what students are you know because it was so difficult the students that were actually navigating and figuring out how to do it we were like let's follow them because if they're smart enough to figure that out we probably can right <laughs> so so that would I would say how it how it started right but I think how it's evolved is engaging with the academic departments and saying so you want your students to go abroad as well right I mean this is a common goal I never walk in anywhere and they say oh that's a stupid idea sending students abroad like that never happens everyone philosophically is really aligned right but where we're not aligned is in our procedures and policies right they'll have policies that really prohibit or inhibit students from going abroad so we'll work with them to say let's let's try to fix this but it's it's with them that will say well if you could just choose you know you've been in academia for decades and you've got you know who your peers are out there where would you want your students to be and and it just usually rattles right off their tongue like oh they should be at Sciences Po you know great who do you know there? <laughs> and then that's usually how the context starts. And it's places like NASA, EIE, and um, API that we would we would start that. We would say our faculty member has been in touch with your faculty member, and they're interested in doing something. And to be frank, it's we're in a, a very luxurious position where when Berkeley calls, usually they they they're Johnny on the spot. Yes, we're ready to meet with you, right? So we're it's enviable in many ways, and and we just start that mountain of work. Really, you're welcome. He was the leader of the highly ranked public university in the world, the best university in the world. There was a big debate in NAFSA in the forum about the shift between long-term programs, semester and year long, to short-term programs. And it seems that the debate is about the length, not about the quality. Because short-terms can be academically much better than the long-term if they're just going there. So I was wondering where do you stand on this debate if I would ask you to comment on the fact that Increasingly, more and more students are going to the short term, and increasingly, the study abroad personnel in universities are pushing students away from short term. Yeah, no, Ideologically, I'm not sure. Sure, no, I'm of two minds, ideologically and practically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think when you, you know, there's this, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, it's almost like this, this curve about student experience, right? And, um, when students first arrive at a study abroad location, they tend to be very, very excited and, and really, you know, ready to take on the world and a month or two in serious depression kind of sets in and they're they're not making friends it's hard here you know I didn't get good grades and da, da, da. and so it can be really it could be difficult and stressful right on a semester program they're returning shortly after that right but when you look at this curve kind of maybe six six to seven months in they hit their groove and they are loving it and they've made their friends and they've come out of that depression and realized that you know they've come a long way right and so so it's great that for them to go through that full experience but it's very not it's not very practical it's not practical for many many people right and and the reason why i think it is is you know nowadays for a student to be competitive to get into graduate school to get a decent job they got to have two majors and a minor they need to have gone abroad and done an internship and started their own nonprofit, right? And <laughs> still graduate in four years, right? <laughs> and we are more crowded than we ever were, so we're putting up more hurdles, right? And we put more requirements on them. And so taking a year to study French, you know, then you're not getting out in four years, or you're not gonna get your double major done, or you're not gonna do your internship, right? So I think students are making choices, probably really good practical choices about well, I want to do both, or I want to do it all. And maybe I'm choosing that my study abroad experience will be a summer program. So my very practical, pragmatic personality is give them what they want. I'd rather have them have a shorter experience that's also sometimes just going to wet their whistle, you know, maybe for a graduate degree abroad or to do a longer program or whatever it is, right, um, than them not have that experience at all. I think, you know, you know, the, the, the market is dictating those shifts. You know, all those year-long opportunities are still there. So I don't think they're being pushed in any direction. It's, it's their choices and they're being pushed by other pressures and factors, right? Cost of education is certainly a big one. I mean, it's just skyrocketed over that time. You can probably graph it together and see see the curves crossing, right? So, so I'd love to see them go longer, but it's not real. Does the study abroad department also facilitate the lifelong uh, learning as well? Yeah. You know, um, it's part of our unit, but it has its own director. She's a really smart, you know, innovative lady, and uh, she runs the show. 
we were put together, I'd say, more because of um, you know synergies around administration and student types and you know non-degree seeking. Like, there's a lot of synergy around how we do our business. So our marketing, IT, finance departments can lend support to them. That's that's something we definitely don't do for the money. <laughs> you know that that I would consider as like kind of its own little nonprofit within Berkeley that's running and doing great things, but. Um, we support it because it's it's just like having university extension. You know, like we we're here a part of the community. We want to serve the community. This is one way in which we do it, and this is engaging with older adults is, is important. And we want them. They live here. You know, they're part of the community. We want them to be engaged and, and supportive of the university. So, but it, I'd say it's really like isolated in the way that it operates. And there's been ideas tossed around about how we might create some integration. Like, could we piggyback? Um, of, like there, there'll be some travel programs for the Osho Lifelong Learning Institute, and they'll be like, "Oh, can we run it right before, or right after that? You know, eight-week student period will overlap for a week, and then we can have this intergenerational learning and stuff happening." And it's just you know practically very difficult because you know, well, they're in five-star hotels and they're in hostels, <laughs> you know, and it's like, how are we going to make? How are we really going to integrate them if you know their 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 level of you know what they're doing is so incredible? Talked in going back to the internship space about non profits. Would Berkeley be far more sort of not far more favorably on a non profit internship um, uh, organization rather than a private sector? Um, you know, it's not something that uh, we've made a conscious decision about. You know, it, it comes down, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, companies that we might be doing business with as opposed to institutions. I'd say the first thing we look at is who are you working with now and what are they willing to say about you. You know, so it's it's all about um, references, uh, who do we know, who knows you. You know, this field, I mean, I did 25 years of study abroad, like, you know everybody who started every company. You know, like, it's, it's, very, it's very insular, sort of um, incestuous, you know, I used to work for them and now they work for me. And I mean, it's just, it's been a lot of the same people for a long time. So you, you look for the, for those that have been engaged and and have the trust of the people you trust because it's impossible to uh, you have to work with so many different partners you know I mean hundreds literally to get it all done and uh, half the time it's just calling someone you know saying who's doing this for you there or if we just engage with them at, at NASA it's okay have your biggest partners email us and tell us what they think about you and I do that all the time. For our partners, I'm always giving references and stuff. It's, it's, it's important. Did I see any, any more hands? Well, thank you very much for. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. We <laughs> <laughs> we recruit teachers to teach in full time paid positions overseas, and one of our biggest challenges is reaching out to universities and finding graduates uh, for these positions. And I was wondering if you have like an appropriate approach of how to um, build a relationship with the university, how to uh, have the university link back to. I think the Career Center is probably the, the best place to go. And you know, I mentioned that um, the linkage that we've made with them recently, Berkeley students for sure utilize it like crazy. And what was interesting, at first we were having a little trouble getting students to sign up for the leave of absence because they were like, well, what's the difference? You know, why should I pay this 90 bucks to go on leave of absence? I can just withdraw. And we asked, well, what do you want? And the answer was, we still want to be able to be part of Callisto which is our big system that's run by the Career Center that links employment and internship opportunities to students. So all the students are in there with a profile and a resume and all this stuff, and employers will go in there and say, we're looking for this. They submit resumes, appointments are made for interviews. You know, it's this giant system, right? That's what they really want access to. So if you're looking to present employment opportunities to undergrads or grads, Career Center and Callisto is how you get in there, manage it, and, and the students are are in there one. Pardon me? Callisto, how, what, what it's is the it? name of the system. How, how, I'm sure it stands for Cal something or other. You know, Do you know how it's spelled? C-A-L-I-S-T-O, Callisto. Yeah. But just What's Career Center, call? you know, that's who you want to work with. They're over on uh, Bancroft. Who else? C-A-L-L. Oh, C-A-L, thanks. <laughs> Are you a student? Yeah, yeah. am I right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to? Did you? No, no. Okay. Thank you very much for having me here today.